Welcome, everyone. My name is Rabbi Jeff Middleman. I am the founding director of Sinai and Synapses, which bridges the worlds of religion and science. And I'm here with uh, Roger Price. I'm actually not with him. He's in Chicago right now. Um, but he's somebody that I've gotten to know over the last few years, um, really interested in the integration of Judaism and science. And so we've talked quite a few times. And he's the author of a book that he'll hold up in a moment called When Judaism Meets Science. Um, which has been a really excellent book, and you can see some of it on, on his website, but you should oh, definitely buy the book to be able to read it. Um, but I want to be able to talk with him here and explore some of the intersections about Judaism and science and how that's different than a lot of the conversations about Christianity and science. Right now we're talking, it's the summer of 2020, and uh, we've been dealing with COVID-19 for a few months and thinking about how that is going to reshape the world. But, uh, but Roger, I'm excited to be able to talk with you here. Well, I'm delighted to be here, and uh, I'm happy to uh, hold up my book so your your folks can see what it looks like. And if they go to any of their favorite e-tailers, they can see it there. Terrific. So, so I want to start with what prompted you to be able to write this book. And and you know, you and I have talked for a while about the the interplay of Judaism and science. And so, what excites you the most, and what prompted you to blog and then turn this into a book here? Well, uh, about 10 years ago, I retired from the practice of law, and I wanted to uh, you know, catch up on the reading that I'd been unable to uh, do while I was practicing. And two of the topics that I wanted to focus on uh, was, uh, one was religion, one was science, and, re and the religion in particular, uh, Judaism. And I started to look for books on Judaism and science, and I found to my surprise and dismay that there were hardly any. Uh, there were maybe a, a half a dozen uh, books in English in the United States uh, that, that one could look at. By contrast, there were hundreds, thousands of books on Christianity and science, and they seem to be coming out uh, on a weekly basis. But I found very, very few uh, talking about Judaism and science. And the ones that I found, uh, although uh, as I discussed them in, in my book, uh, were valuable to one degree or another, none of them did what I wanted to do, which is to say none of them really applied contemporary science to the text we have in the Torah and the Tanakh. Uh, none of them really addressed how science and Judaism interplay on contemporary issues from uh, abortion to vaccinations. And none of them looked ahead. None of them looked to the future. Uh, and uh, so this, this frustrated me, and I thought for a moment I was going to have to write the book I wanted to read, um, and I realized quickly I didn't have the temperament or the, the knowledge base uh, to do that. My kids suggested that I write a blog, and after they patiently explained what that was, uh, I started to write a blog, and, and some uh, years later, I had uh, well over 50 essays and 125,000 or so words, and I thought this this might become a book with a little bit of organization and a uh, little bit of editing. Uh, and uh, having gone up and down the hill with myself and whether I wanted to go through that work, I decided it was important to do so. And uh, so, uh, I, fortunately, I found a, a publisher, and uh, we have a book. So I, I, I want to highlight something that, that you brought up, which is that for a lot of the conversations about religion and science, a lot of the books are about Christianity and science, and, and often it's about evolution and, and creationism. And that's not much of a live issue in Judaism. And, and when, when we talk about this with Sinai and Synapses, a lot of people push back and say, well, Jews accept evolution. Why is this even an issue? And one thing that I think both you and I have discovered is that when you're looking at specific topics like vaccination or um, genetic engineering or artificial intelligence, there's actually some questions to be able to explore where we can find some wisdom from Judaism, find some wisdom from science, and they're not necessarily going to overlap. They're, they may be in tension. And so how can we look at what's a particular topic and, and where do Judaism and science explore those together? Well, I think, I think that's right. Um, there are some issues that are important to the Christian community, uh, which are not important to the Jewish community. 
Uh, and in part, that's because the nature of Christianity and the nature of Judaism is quite different. Um, with respect to the, with respect to current issues, uh, there is a wide variety of opinion on a number of topics that, that you mentioned. Uh, uh, genetically modified organisms, for instance, or gun safety uh, issues, or for that matter, abortion and, and vaccination, and we could, we could go on. Um, and Jews take a, there are different groups of Jews have different approaches to those topics. Unfortunately, in our community, we don't have uh, a lot of interdenominational discussion. Uh, we tend not to draw, one group tends not to draw on the wisdom that another group may have. Uh, uh, and, and so the, the conversation sort of gets stilted and people not only revert back to their tribe, they revert back to their subgroup within the larger tribe. Uh, that hinders, that hinders uh, the development of wisdom. And it hurts our community. And we've seen that hurt our community, most particularly on the vaccination issue, right. uh, but on, on some of the other issues too. And I, I suspect that's going one day when we get a, uh, if we get a vaccine for COVID-19, uh, that's going to become a, another problem on top of the problem we have with measles and some of the other things we've been wrestling with. Well, and, and you also bring this up and you, and you talk about this in, in, in your book also, which is one of the challenges of fake news. And one thing that, that we're grappling with, I think a lot of the Jewish community is, is grappling with, it, particularly with COVID-19, and we'll use that as an example because that's on people's minds right now, um, the information that comes in around COVID-19 has changed and has been potentially conflicting and it's hard to know. And rabbis are not epidemiologists and they're trying to do the best that they can of integrating the best knowledge that they have to keep their community safe. Um, but being able to say, what's the, what's the best information that we have? How can I then understand it? How can I then translate it then? How can I then um, implement it? There are multiple different steps where, where problems can arise. And what happens if you're finding information that's inaccurate? What if, what if you're looking to groups that, that, whether intentional or not, are sharing inaccurate information? Um, are you seeing, and, and, and you talk about this a little bit in, in your book too, of how do, we, how do we find and integrate scientific information if we're not scientists? Yeah, the, the uh, main discussion that I had in my book on fake news, uh, as you know, dealt with a battle for Jerusalem 2,700 years ago. And there's a report of that battle in the Book of Kings in our Bible. But there's also a report of that battle in, a, uh, in an Assyrian uh, tablet uh, uh, called Prism, uh, one of which happens to be at the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago. Um, and you can read both reports and you'll get uh, some overlap, but you'll get different understandings of what happened in that battle. And it's the first recorded instance that I know of, of what you would call fake news uh, today. With respect to the current dilemma of, of COVID-19, um, one of our problems, because we have such rapid communication today, is that we're communicating before we know things uh, and, and, and we're not double checking uh, our information. With respect to this particular virus, um, we haven't had enough time to really understand it. Uh, and we haven't had, I mean, I read last week that there is some thought that there is a special mutation that affects the Chicago area. Uh, now, if that's true, I suspect that means there's a special mutation which is affecting uh, Miami or Los Angeles or Westchester County or s some specific community. Uh, we haven't had time to really understand this virus and uh, without getting uh, too political, the leadership at the national level has been uh, uh, lacking. Um, a few weeks ago, I wrote a piece uh, about COVID-19 and I talked about um, the, wise, the wise ones of COVID-Gabernia. 
which is a town in the old country. Uh, and the gist of their wisdom was that people should wear masks. When I completed that, uh, we were at the height of the first wave crisis. Uh, and within a few weeks later, the numbers started to look much better. And I thought, oh boy, my piece is now dated. What I didn't really realize is that it's really predated <laughs> because we are getting more and more information that suggests that the wearing of masks uh, is good for, for two reasons. One, it helps keep anyone who, has, who is infected from spewing uh, the virus towards someone else. And two, to some degree, it helps wh whoever's walking down the street from receiving the, uh, uh, the infected spray. Um, and if both parties wear masks, then you really do have a reasonably decent ability to protect yourself from getting an, an infection. Um, the lessons that we have uh, from the Jewish tradition in this, and, and I cite uh, uh, you know, seven, uh, seven of the wise people of Kovic Gebernia, uh, is reasonably clear. We have an obligation to protect those who can't help themselves. Um, we value uh, life and health and the protection of our bodies. And we have, a, we have a communal interest in making sure that our community is safe for the youngest and the oldest and all those in between. And uh, I think that, you know, that's, that's it. An important way of drawing this distinction of the interplay of Judaism and science, because it's not trying to say let's prove the Torah is true, <laughs> right? That's not something that that Jews tend to do as, as it is, um, and it's also a fool's errand because um, the Torah is not a science textbook, um, and it's also not well. They live in these separate worlds, and they can happily you know here's the science and here's the Judaism, and they're separated out. But it's rather we have these values that are articulated and and there have been um rabbinic texts and legal texts of, of different complicated ways of thinking about how do we balance different values and that was described 2500 years ago and 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 1500 years ago um 2000 years ago as, as we as, as the talmud is written that are then being applied to questions that we're facing today of questions of health versus privacy, um, questions of, of individual rights versus a responsibility to the community. Those are, those are questions that we are really grappling with in a variety of different ways, dealing with the science, but also dealing with the politics, because science and politics also interplay. That, that trying to be able to say these are separate worlds and, and never the twain shall meet is, is not accurate and it's also not helpful. Well, that's true. And one of the values of the Jewish uh, uh, ethical tradition is not simply that it's old, although parts of it are quite old, but it's based on now thousands of years of human experience. Mm -hmm. And while our understanding of science uh, has changed, uh, human nature hasn't changed all that much. Uh, and our relationships with each other, with our, with our significant others, with our children, with our parents, with the community around us. Those, those are age old uh, uh, issues, which is one of the reasons that a lot of the stories in the Torah resonate today, because we can see ourselves um, in, in those stories. Um, the other aspect of this is because our tradition is so old and has so much experience, it has both majority and minority viewpoints on many, many topics. And if you read the tradition as a whole, you can gain a, an appreciation for the nuance with which um, various uh, communities have dealt with various problems. And so uh, if, you, if you look at a, at a problem like uh, uh, gun safety, or you look at a problem uh, like abortion, um, in, in, the civil, in the civic community, these problems are reduced to bumper stickers. And those bumper stickers do not come anywhere close to being reasoned or analytical or helpful. Mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the Jewish world, um, 
these issues have been discussed and debated and lines have been drawn and, and moved. And it is the nuance of these uh, that has come out of this discussion, uh, which is so valuable. And in part, if you take a look at the book, you will see that you know, my general view is that uh, we can look at Judaism as a conversation. It's a 2,500 perhaps plus year old conversation with many viewpoints and um, many bits of wisdom. Uh, and uh, part of what that teaches us is the need when we get into these delicate issues for a good deal of humility when we are addressing uh, some of the topics you've mentioned. Well, and you mentioned at the beginning of, the, of our conversation that your book is also looking to not just look towards the past, but towards the future. What are a couple of the things that you think are gonna be interesting and, and critical live issues for the Jewish community in the future surrounding Judaism and science? Well, uh, there's, there are two issues, which I think are gonna be of, of utmost importance for all of us. Um, one is uh, the possibility that we will encounter intelligent life on another planet. Uh, this would be, to put it mildly, a game changer. Uh, but I think if, if that's going to happen, although, you know, the, the ship could land tomorrow, I suppose, but, but more likely, that's an issue for the distant future. For the immediate future, there is the question of the impact of uh, artificial intelligence and robotics. In, in the book, I posit the, uh, the development of an android, uh, a robot shaped like, like a human, who is then uploaded with all the literature and lore of the Jewish people. And, uh, uh, is sitting around uh, its home one day contemplating the Torah and the Talmud and all the histories and the novels and the literature and the poetry and, and the records of all the communities over the past thousands of years and understands that being Jewish is more than having data at hand. Being Jewish is being able to talk with Jews and interact with Jews and do Jewish stuff. And, the, and, the, and this android, which I now call a Jew droid, decides it wants to go into a show and become a member. Um, and the question is, will the, will the congregation accept the Jew droid? The issue from a Jewish perspective is that the Torah teaches us that we should respect the stranger. We should welcome the stranger. And the question presented is, is, is this stranger too strange? Or what do we do with this, with this uh, creature? Um, and I have found that in my, in my travels, uh, this, is, this is thought to be a very intriguing uh, question. Uh, it's not something that's going to happen tomorrow, but I originally thought maybe 25 years from now, this would be a real issue. I think it's less than that. I think it's five years or 10 years. And if you've been following uh, the developments around the world, you know that a couple of years ago for the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, a uh, church in Wittenberg, Germany, created a, uh, a robot which, which uh, provided blessings to the visitors. Mm -hmm. There is now a, a statue that looks like a statue you might see in a Catholic home that reads uh, Bible verses to uh, whoever's in, in the tome. Uh, we don't have anything like that, but but we do know that a few years ago at the Jewish Museum in Berlin, there was a robot that wrote a Torah scroll. Last year in San Francisco, there was a giant robot that lit a menorah with a spark coming out of one of its uh, fingers. So it's not too far-fetched to wonder um, how uh, robotics uh, will impact the congregational life uh, as teachers, as, uh, you know, uh, workers around the synagogue, uh, uh, any number of issues. Well, and, and you know, I, I'm thinking my wife is on our synagogue's ritual committee, and in February, she, I think she joined in, in January or February, and their theoretical discussion, they were going to talk about this in January or February, just to be able to learn how to study conservative responsa, um, totally theoretical question of, can you have a minion through the computer? And that right. was going to be the totally theoretical question they were going to look at in, in February. And um, 
ended up not being so theoretical within about two months. And, and I, think that, I, think that's, I think that's an important piece of, of not just what are the topics that we're going to be looking at, but what's the process by which the Jewish community explores some of these questions that are advancing scientifically and technologically. Well, that's, ex that's exactly right. Of course, there is a, there is a substory to the story of the Jew drive, uh, which is uh, the question, what does it mean to be Jewish today? Um, but taking the, taking the idea of the Jew drive more literally, uh, that, is, that is something that's going to come up. And those, those people who work with synagogues, uh, I'm sure, would, would all agree there's at least one person on their board of directors who could be replaced by the, uh, by the Jew drive. Right. Uh, right, but, they, but may have different, they may have different views on who that person should be, but they would all agree there's at least one person. And, and, and I think that's, you know, the other interesting thing that you're, that you're bringing up, which is, and the rabbis did this in the Talmud all the time, which is to push something to its sort of absurd limit to be able to actually go to the core of a big question of, you know, can you, is a sukkah kosher if it's built on the side of an elephant? And they've explained and they've explored that question. That's and they they do that to be able to ask what's a question of permanency and 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 being able to move around. So you know, saying can a Jew droid be a member of the of the of the Jewish community and and count for a minion and be synagogue president is the same as the question as can a woman be counted in a minion, which is a question. Can a can somebody who is married to somebody who's not Jewish? Can somebody who is not Jew somebody who's not Jewish say a particular blessing? Right. Every community has its different lines that they're going to draw, and they may be different in the Orthodox community or conservative community or reform community, but there are going to be lines that that are going to be drawn somewhere. And and so how do we think through what that question is going to be? Well, that's exactly right. And and when I've raised this issue in groups and I and I've asked the question, tell me your objection to the, what are the objections one might raise at the congregational meeting about whether to allow the Jew drawing in? And uh, someone will raise one objection or another. And I, I normally say, is that issue uh, identified on your membership application? And uh, all of a sudden I hear this real quiet. <laughs> oh, no, I guess it's not. Well, if it's not, why are you raising it now? Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, some congregations have very detailed applications and uh, some, <laughs> as long as you're ambulatory and then maybe even not, you can, you can come in. Yeah, well, I, I think what's, what's fun about your book, and I, and I really, I highly recommend it, is that you explore some really, I, I was going to say unorthodox, but they're very, they're, they're unusual topics that you might not necessarily think there's conversations about Judaism and science, but by having as the entry point of these questions that are grappling with, they help us understand the science a little bit better and also some of the questions that the Jewish community needs to grapple with as well. Yeah, well, I tried, uh, you know, some of the issues I got into, I got into because I read stuff in Jewish quarters that made no sense to me. For instance, I remember reading an article that, that, that argued that Jews should not get vaccines because vaccines, they should not get vaccinations because vaccines contain trafe products. Uh, and, and it is certainly true if you look up the ingredient list of various vaccines, which you can do on the internet through the Centers for Disease Control, um, you will see some very, uh, uh, how should I put this, unpleasant uh, products that are uh, in vaccine formulations. But that doesn't mean vaccines are uh, not kosher or suitable for Jewish use because the whole notion of kashrut uh, has to deal with consumption, oral consumption. And if you are getting a vaccination in your arm or your thigh uh, or some other uh, part of you, uh, you are not violating uh, any law of kashrut. And I, I make that abundantly clear by citing uh, rabbis uh, of all uh, of, of all denominations around the world. Um, and, and that led into a separate topic of the uh, safety and efficacy of, uh, of, of vaccine, 
And the data on that with respect to measles, and polio, and some of the other horrible diseases we've encountered is, is really crystal clear. Yeah, and I think that's, that's an important piece. And, and so I really want to thank you for taking some, be able, I really want to thank you for taking some time to be able to unpack both the kinds of topics that you're grappling with, but also the process by which you're, you're looking at this. And so, um, again, I really recommend Roger's website, uh, which is, I believe it's judaismandscience.com, correct? That is correct. And, uh, and his book, When Judaism Meets Science, and uh, continue to really explore some of these questions. He's been a good friend of Sinai and Synapses and thrilled to be able to talk with you here today. Thank you for having me, Jeff. Uh, you and your family uh, stay safe and well. Thank you. Bye-bye now.